team <laughs> gestures, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> it's the internet, we can get away with anything. Um, uh, out of, in the FAA, there's 44,000 people. 33,000 of those folks are air traffic controllers. Um, the FAA's budget is 15 billion, which is kind of the size of NASA's. NASA's coming up on 20 these days. Um, <coughs> NASA, I think NASA has like 18,000 people. So FAA has a much larger payroll than NASA does. Um, the number of folks at FAA who work in commercial space is 70. The fraction is 0 .002. 0 .00 small. Yeah, 0, 0 small. And the, the, our budget is 15 million out of the 15 billion, the fraction being 0 .001, 1,000 the budget goes to space. Um, that is hopefully going to change pretty soon. We're hoping to actually almost triple it in the next couple of years. Um, and so things are looking good for that. But anyway, so we're a very small part of the FAA. When you, when you talk to the FAA folks, they don't even know there's a space component, or if they do, they know nothing about space. On our side, a lot of the folks in our area do understand the aviation side because they came from it, either being aviation mechanics or pilots. But for example, me, I have no idea what's going on. You know, I get emails, anonymous emails from folks with great ideas for airplane stuff, and I go, I am so not the guy you want. <laughs> I just send an email and I right you I am so not the guy you want to talk to. And so, um, so anyway, so our job there, the Office of Commercial Space Transportation was created actually in 1984, um, and it was under Ronald Reagan, and it was actually a part of the Department of Transportation. It was called the OCST, the Office of Commercial Space Transportation. And um, our, our, we have a twofold mission at that, um, that we were given at that point. First one is to judi judiciously regulate and ensure the safety of a, the commercial space industry right. um, to protect the uninvolved public, the national interest of the United States, and the international obligations you know, of the United States. So that's mission number one. The second mission was to encourage, facilitate, and promote the industry. And as I was telling Bruno, sometimes there's this perception that regulating and encouraging are at odds, when in fact, I can make an argument, even though it involves a lot of stick figures and analogies to the you know, field and track, you know, sports arena, that we could create these hurdles that companies have to jump over to make sure it's safe. But if we were not obligated to encourage, facilitate, and promote, we would just make that hurdle really high. And nobody, everybody would be safe, and they would, very few would fly. Whereas in this country, in this country, whereas well, no, any, any U.S. citizen, right, that's or anybody flying in this country, that, that's my point. That's right, because the, the only thing that would do is it just push everybody off, offshore, offshore. The well, actually, though, if, yeah, it's it, not a theory. Well, it, it's not a theory. It's not a U.S. Thought. U.S. U.S. people would not fly offshore because they would still be obligated to fly through our regs. Some of them would did, would would give up their citizenship. Right. That's right. Or go for a dual one. Or get dual citizenship. So or get dual. Citizenship. We regulate Americans. We regulate U.S. citizens, US no matter where they fly. Because of space is international. Because, because of the space treaty that says that the launching nation is required is responsible for the Cost object. Cost. For the national space activities. Mm -hmm. yep. It's Say, not for the national space activities. Yeah. Object is kind of irrelevant here if you were talking about people flying, okay, right? Okay, right. But I mean, if, if the spacecraft comes out of orbit, Right. or not, and it comes down and lands on Canadian soil or something, yeah, right. the U.S. government, if it's a U.S. launch thing. The, the so basically you have extraterritorial jurisdiction, right? You, you're a lawyer? I am. I am not. <laughs> <laughs> what do they have? Well, we don't have as well. Huh? In, what do you say? Sorry. We have uh, extraterritorial extra territorial. jurisdiction. But only, if, again, only if it's American, so it's launched from an American. Well, any country, like if Spain launched and it landed in Australia, Spain is responsible for yeah. the damages. It, except if the company that did the launching or the organization that did the launching is headed by an American. That's right. Yeah, that, that's my point. It's also. the national register. Whatever right. country it's registered to, that's going to be the country that's responsible. So as, I, as an American citizen, I can't go to you know, Timbuktu and start a company there. Because it will be and, and then hope to avoid, by doing that, hope to avoid regulation by the FAA. I can't do that. So that, that's the, that's why I came to this session. So earlier, I'd say. Okay. So commercial business of space, it has to be an international endeavor. 
Because otherwise it makes no sense that it's the US regulates something, but if you don't like it, just go to other place. Well, that's right. Except that, that, that's, that's a that's not, barrier to that. You can't do that. Right. If you don't like it, let's say I want to go launch in Woomera, right. Australia, and I'm an American citizen. If Woomera, if Australia had a regulatory regime, you'd have to follow that because right. you're flying it, launching in Australia. But because I'm a US citizen, I'm obligated to. But I'm not, so I can't decide, right? Because well, Spain, like, imagine if Spain doesn't have a regulatory issue. Right. I could go to you and say, I want to do this. But if you like it, I can go to Japan. That's right, Japan. that's right. Yes. But right now, the abs you're absolutely right. You can go someplace where there's no regulatory regime. And if your country doesn't have a regulatory regime, fine, if you can get away with it. Um, chances, are, chances are that somebody's going to say, hey, wait a minute. You know, any rational person or any rational government organization is going to say, wait a minute, this is a dangerous activity. Right. You know, so, Even I mean, some irrationals one will say that. Um, but the, the point is that it is the minute that activity occurs or is threatening to occur, somebody someplace is going to wake up and say, by the way, Mr. President of Ghana, did you know that there's this guy running around your country who's going to start launching stuff any day now? That's right. And you will be responsible if anything goes bad? That's right. Okay, how quickly do you think the answer no will show up at your doorstep with guns? <laughs> well, and in fact, you look at interorbital. Interorbital um, systems is a, a, a company. I was going to ask that question. Say again? Uh, I was uh, going to ask that Oh, question. yeah, right. Interorbital is a company that wants to launch off of the oh. shores of Tonga, right? Because right. they have a personal relationship with the king, the king yeah, of Tonga. Um, right now, because they're U.S. citizens, they're going to be obligated to talk to us about it. They're also, we're all, we're, right now we're trying to figure out, do they have to meet our environmental requirements? Which is a big deal. Because right. Tonga might not have environmental requirements. I'm sure they don't. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they do. So, so there's, there's a lot of discussions going on about that. Um, so the point is, we regulate US citizens, whether they're launching in the US or abroad, and non-US citizens, if they're launching in the US. That's the domain over what are your, um, what is the policy if a U.S. citizen or entity operating abroad violates your regulation and says, we don't care? Well, there's... What is, like, how do you retaliate or how do you control that? The, uh, and I'm going to repeat the question just to the audience out, right. there, out there just because, you know, it's, there's probably three people listening. Um, okay, if somebody decides to ignore or violates the um, regulatory uh, rules of, you know, the FAA, well, ignoring it is one thing. Flying without a license, they, they can just be shut down, I suppose. You know, and they, again, I, I don't really know the answer. To that okay. Question. But um, if there's a violate, if if we send inspectors to all launches that we know about, right? Right. So if we here, abroad. yeah. Well, here we haven't had an abroad situation yet, but presumably, well, right now the point is that even amateur launches, which are launches that are flying below the radar of the FAA, well, they, we know about it. But they're flying under the amateur rocketry rules, right. so they don't have to get a permit or a license. Um, even those, we're trying to send inspectors out just to make sure that things are okay and, and things you know don't go terribly wrong. Um, even though we're not regulating them, you know, per se. Presumably, any launch going on, you know, that we know about, we would be sending inspectors to inspectors to for a very long time until we feel comfortable with the, the operator. Um, if they so if they violate their terms of their um, their permit or their license, right. there are you know the licenses or the permits can be revoked. There are fines that can be you know the, the authorization or the regulations actually give certain you know ways that those kinds of infractions can be dealt with. Okay. So, okay, so we were talking about what the two missions were of AST to encourage, facilitate, and promote, as well as to ensure public safety, national interests, and international obligations national security things for the United States government. Um, we have, like I said, 70 people out of 44,000 within the FAA. Um, we're hoping that that's going to grow pretty soon. Our, our annual budget is about $15 million a year, but uh, we've got requests in the next couple of years to almost triple that. Um, so the number of people will go up as well. Um, I was telling, just announced last week, I was telling some folks earlier, just announced last week this commission that was created, uh, that is headed up by Charles Bolden and I forget, uh, Gary Locke. what Locke? Gary Locke. Gary Locke of the Department of Commerce. 
they helped had um, they headed up a commission on Florida economic development, forty million dollars. It was a presidential commission, um, and they put the report on the on White House's desk uh, not that long ago, last week. And in there, it, it says we recommend five million dollars go to this, the creation of a technical center for the FAA for commercial space. So that the plans there are to do like I don't know operational standards, whatever it would be, um, but it would be um, to employ. 50 civil servants located at the Kennedy Space Center to promote or to you know fulfill the commercial space transportation mission. So the commercial space mission um, issue of business is done by you, not by NASA, or both. Regulation is purely the domain of the Office of Commercial Space Transportation, the FAA. NASA doesn't have a regulatory mission. Now you might say, well, what about NASA launches? Do we worry about that? And we don't. We do not regulate missions by the government or for the government. So if NAP shuttle launches, we do not regulate. If there's a military satellite going up on a Delta or an Atlas, we don't regulate those. There are certain cases where there might be an Earth observation satellite, a NOAA satellite, that is going up on a commercial rocket, but NASA is not taking possession until it's in orbit. So it's considered a commercial launch, even though it's for the government. For NASA? Say again. Contractors for NASA, like the upcoming contracting missions that NASA may have, like SpaceX and all these things. Well, those will all be. The question is, are the launches being conducted under COTS mm -hmm. or under the CRS, the Commercial Resupply Services contract? Will those be uh, regulated by the FAA? And the answer is yes. It was um, by agreement with NASA. They decided these are going to be commercial launches. We're just buying the services, so therefore they're going to be um, regulated by the FAA. So, FAA has been working very closely with the people down at Johnson, the uh, the CC, the what, our C three PO office down there, commercial crew and cargo program office uh, down there, and you know working on you know the proper amount of oversight and insight into the program. <clears throat> so that's been really good, and, and they've also been. You know, working very closely with NASA on CRS, um, the Commercial Resupply, which is a three point six billion dollar contract. So, um, when NASA announced, or when the president announced his budget in February, that he was going to put six point one billion dollars over five years into commercial, um, commercial space transportation uh, market, six point one plus three point six that's nine point seven billion dollars. Plus the 500 million, you know, half a billion that has, is being spent on COTS program. There's 10 billion dollars that NASA represents as a customer and, and to encourage commercial space. So that was a great number, and we were in, in, in our office. We're saying, look at NASA's ponying up to the tune of 10 billion bucks. All this congressional interest. Look at the number of hearings on commercial space specifically that were going on as a result of the Augustine Commission, you know, human space flight report. Um, and we were saying the tidal wave is coming. We need no, more support in in our office, and I think the people we've convinced everybody within the FAA. I think we've started convincing everybody within the Department of Transportation. So I think uh, we'll see. Well, I'm keeping our fingers crossed that the budget you know reflects that. So, so what else do we do? We regulate operations. We don't re really regulate vehicles. We don't. We regulate the operations. Of Vehicles. We regulate the operations of spaceports, the launch and re, uh, launch and reentry of vehicles, the operations of spaceports, um, and what else do we do? I've got it. I'm, I'm working off of you know pure memory here. But so so it's, when it comes to spaceports, you know again there's a certain uh, set of regulations they have to meet. Um, right now there are I think it's eight separate spaceports that have received FAA licenses. Um, for operations, the most recent I think was Jackson. Cecil Field down in Florida. The spaceports that we've licensed include Kodiak uh, in Alaska, um, Mojave. Uh, I think Vandenberg is Vandenberg. There's a map in. The a map in there was a map in the Ignite talk. I showed the map there, and since we don't have a view graph here, uh, there's Cecil Field. There's Space Florida. Wallops. There's Wallops. Um, there's a private launch facility in Texas. Mm. It's the purview of uh, Mr. Bezos. Mm. That's where he launches his Blue Origin, his uh, New Shepard, you know, vehicle from. Forgot New Mexico. New Mexico's in there. And, and recent. Yes. Here's a question for you. Uh, 
Virgin Galactic obviously operates or is going to operate from Spaceport America. Right. And as a joint venture with Scale Composites, it's within the jurisdiction of FAA to regulate what they're doing, right? Right. Uh, they also want to uh, start services from Kiruna in right. Sweden. Right. Are you going to extend regulation to try and cover those launches in any way? I, I, again, the first they're going to be just Kiruna up and back. Right. Um, I, right now, I think the if, I see, I don't know if there's a specific answer, but right. here's, the, here's the if then right. of that one. The scale composite inversion, I think, together, or maybe separately, I don't know, they created something called the Mojave Aerospace Ventures. Mm -hmm. And that's the company that's building the ships or taking possession of the ships. Okay. And so I, if that's a US company and that's the company that's going to be operating the vehicles in Karuna, then yeah, that we would regulate it. But as presumably their operations would be, you know, if they're not all that different than what's going on in the US. And I guess the traceability on that would be our liability of the outer space treaty. Well, that's why that's why US. well that's why a U.S. company launching overseas has got to met to meet our regulations. And we had that discussion right before you came in. But um, but the presumption I was making, and I don't want to go too far. Hope I'm not talking too much out of school. Is that if you know if they jump through most of the hoops, getting their uh, regulatory authority here within the U.S., then if that, as long as they don't change operations, presumably it would be similar. And okay. we, we, but it, you would but you wouldn't be regulating. Karuna Air Space Port yeah. itself. That's up to it's just the because it's not a US entity. Right, right. That makes that's pretty But cool. then I think the contract goes under the name of a uh, Virgin right. and Rich Brand Branson, right? Brand. But uh so scale composite is not in the picture other than producing the object. And again, I don't know, I, I'm not I don't I'm just going to yeah, no, no, and again, the, and this Mojave Aerospace Ventures is in there somewhere too. So they've created a, some company there. To yeah, but they it. are just producing the object. It's like, let's say the analogy is somebody producing the satellite, but it's a, a different country. Somebody else buys it, and yeah. then somebody else operates. Or somebody else, so then, I don't know. I don't know how it's, okay. I don't know how it's done. We're getting into too much you know, guessing. Because if Virgin is buying it and operating it, then Virgin is a British, Virgin Galactic might be a US company for all I know. Then they're under FAA jurisdiction. Right. If, it's, if it's the Virgin company, it's a British company, then you gotta worry about you know, I uh, yeah. Well, which is a major deal. So, but at least they have the money to 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 pursue that. They do have their money. Yeah. But ITAR. I've heard a lot of companies. Not a lot. I've heard companies and lawyers say ITAR is just a cost of doing business. And it's we so might be talking about two hundred thousand dollars. Those are usually the companies that have five hundred lawyers. Right. 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 It's a cost. Of, it's an entry barrier. Yeah. In fact, for the big companies, it's a great entry barrier for the threat of new entrants. Boeing has six hundred lawyers that do nothing but ITAR. And they're all paid on cost plus. Exactly. <laughs> so they don't care how much it costs. Wonderful. Right. Um, I, can, I have a, a, a slightly... Uh, did, did it disparage Boeing there? Sorry. For my internet no, audience. It's a great place to be if you, you, know, if you can get the job. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll, I'll think about my question. Okay. 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 Um, okay, so we, we regulate oh. operations. Okay, there's this... Uh, so what do, we, what do we regulate? We offer permits. Which, okay, now let me back up. We have different levels of things we off operate, or we offer in terms of regulation. One is called a safety permit. Um, this is something that was um, created in the Commercial Space Launch Amendments Act in 2004. If you create a widget, an ECLIS system, uh, you know, whatever, an avionics suite, a new windscreen or something, and you want to get, get a, like a seal of approval from our office so that you can go and take it to the um, vehicle manufacturers and say, hey, listen, here's something that the FAA knows about. It's, it's been given their seal of approval called a safety permit, and you can use it on your vehicle, and it's going to be one less thing you have to worry about when you come to the, go to them for licensing or permitting. We offer, some, we offer that service. It's called a safety permit. Um, typically, it's for safety system critical kind of um, things. But uh, for example, we just, off, we just issued our first safety permit not too long ago to the NASTAR um, training facility for the suborbital kind of training, their centrifugal training and their hypo, um, hypobaric chamber training that they do. We've given them a safety permit for the training they do. So um, that's the first thing we offer is it's something called a safety permit. Next thing we offer is a permit 
for launch or re-entry. Um, that is a, like a light version of the license. A license, you got to have all this flight data. You got to have show that your vehicle, when it blo you know when it blows up, it doesn't create this huge debris field, or that you know during its flight path, it, you know this instantaneous point of impact is not you know going right over orphanages or whatever. You know, so you've got all these fairly stringent kind of data requirements to get a license. Well, and, it, and the government is allowed up to 180 days to, um, from the time that the application is sufficiently complete to process the license and give it to you or not. Um, a, a light version of that is called the permit. Um, the U.S. government has a, only 120 days instead of 180 days to process um, the application once it's deemed sufficiently complete. The, the presumption is that you're going to be using the flights under the permits to create the data required for the licenses, so it's a lot easier to get. The data requirements are not as stringent. However, you are not allowed to fly for compensation during the permitting flights. You can charge customers for flights or services rendered with vehicles that are licensed but not permitted. Can you accept the donation? There are ways you can trick this, not trick the system, but you can do service exchanges yeah, or whatever. Yeah. And 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 marketing and sponsorships. Oh, I don't, I don't know, but there, there's a lot more restrictions. The point is that this is a riskier vehicle. You're, you're doing the flights for, um, testing. for testing and for data collection. To, <coughs> and below like, that is class three. Well, then let's say you don't, you want to fly. For example, the, the Mastins and the Armadillo right now, they don't even have a permit. They're flying under amateur rocketry rules. Up until about I don't know a year, year and a half ago. There, lit, there were three limits under which you could fly a rocket and still be called an amateur rocket. You had to have less than 200,000 pound seconds of total impulse, less than a 15 second burn time limit, and then I think the last was a 12 PSI ballistic coefficient there boundary, which I don't think that ever came into, uh, nobody ever pressed against that boundary. Everybody was running into this 15 second burn second limit. So you couldn't turn the engine on for more than 15 seconds, so you could only go so high. About a year and a half ago, the FAA decided we're going to redefine what it means to be amateur. We're going to remove the 15 second burn limit. Right now, you've got the ballistic coefficient and the total impulse limit. That's it. So the Lunar Lander Challenge vehicles, Armadillo, Mastin, Paul Breed, all flew under amateur rocket rules. Rocket rule. So they, didn't, they weren't required to get permits. We were still there. We were still observing what was going on. Um, but they didn't have to go through the process right. of getting permits. Which really saved the competition. It saved it's, it, a lot of people, and it makes sense. I mean, 15 seconds, I don't know if it was arbitrary or not, but they took it away. Well, the 15 seconds was great for when the only thing you were doing was vertical launch and then prey. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're trying to do vertical launch and then some kind of landing. Yeah, and then all of a sudden. <laughs> all of a sudden, 15 seconds is like nothing. Yeah. So, so, so that, so those are, th that was, so th this is how you can fly, how companies not can fly without any kind of regulatory, you know, uh, you know, process, you know, or control. And that's what they're doing right now. So Mastin is flying under, but they're, they're starting to come up against the limits. You know, how, how does class three fit into that? Good. Okay. I don't know anything about rocket I'm, 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 sure. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm running into some folks at Tripoli that just, Tripoli, which is one of the two major amateur rocketry, amateur rocketry associations around, um, they, they have a special process for supporting the members to doing class three flights, which are sort of, you know, you get level one, level two, level three, Tripoli certificates. And then there's this thing that w where the Tripoli sort of stops and FAA begins called class three rockets. And I just don't quite understand that. Don't know, don't know. Um, okay, so. Safety, perm safety permits, permits, and licenses. There's spaceport uh, operation licenses as well. I don't know very much about them. Uh, Reentry, li we license not only launches, but reentries also. So far, nobody's ever had to be licensed for a reentry, but that's coming up because the Dragon capsule is going to be. Um, Wait, but they've reentered one already. They dropped one. They dropped, they dropped one it. In they uncontrolled reentry. They did, they did reenter one already. Falcon 9. Did the, did the, Falcon, the Falcon 9 came back. And that was, uh, I don't know if it was licensed for reentry or not. That's interesting. It, it was a dumb, it was an engineering. Right, it was a structural. Right? It was a structural. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a controlled reentry. Wow, no. 
I think the distinction that you're referring to under your licensing regime is that um, if the if the component is is capable of doing reentry and surviving and reaching near a surface, right. then FAA gets concerned. Good. Okay. Whereas yeah, the dragon didn't have a heat show. Whereas in this case, it was guaranteed to to burn. Okay, okay. and maybe that's probably what they had to show okay. so to get out of the process. I mean, because they are responsible for the, the components that are going to be ordered right. and whatnot. Stage one splashes down somewhere. Yeah, that's right. Um, I, I do. I have, an, I have sure. a question, sir, along these lines. NTSB is NTSB part of FAA? NTSB is, an, as I understand it, it's an independent entity. There are, there are, pre, well, last year at our conference, every year in February, the FAA does a conference called the Annual Commercial Space Transportation Conference. We held it last year um, across the river in Arlington during the four days the government was shut down in February with the snowstorm. We had 100 people there day one, and we had 140 people day, there wow. two, day two. And uh, the show went on, and NTSB gave a presentation in our Surviving the Mishap. Now, who's going to, who's going to do the investigation of any major mishap? I would have to go back, and you can get the presentations online. It will be an NTSB-controlled uh, uh, mishap investigation okay. operation, and FAA will support. Has there been anything like that, like the, the scale? The scaled that was in the, the scaled nitrous oxide decomposition and rapid decomposition that called the cause of death of three people. Um, that was an industrial accident. There was okay. no they, they were they were just pumping right. nitrous. You know. So NTSB wasn't part of that. No, no, that was a uh, Cal OSHA. Okay. So so now let's suppose, um, you know, it would be NTSB. It would be NTSB. Would out. FAA be part of that? Yeah, that FAA, FAA would, would be riding shotgun with those guys. Okay. And, now. Uh, both the FAA currently has, for general aviation community, I think for commercial aviation community, a huge accident databases. That's right? right. The FAA currently does that, right? Right. I, I, I take your word for it. Well, I, I think, well, either NTSB does or FAA. I'm sure that is. Somebody does. Right. But I thought it was FAA, but I could be wrong. Um, so, I, is there going to be an accident database? coming from you guys, or is it going to get folded into one of the others? A year or a year and a half ago, every two, every, twice a year, our office holds what's called the ComStack meetings, Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee meetings. They're open to the public. The next one's October 6th and 7th, um, and it's going to be somewhere in Washington, D.C. here. Um, about a year ago, our deputy administrator got up and talked about the need to create a database for accident, uh, accidents and mishaps. And you know it'll benefit everybody, and so I'm not exactly. It's on our radar. I don't know exactly where that activity is going on right now. Um, Dave Masson just entered the room. He probably answered the questions better. Uh, some of the questions we're having better than I. Have you heard anything about the accident or mishap database that Dan Lack talked about a couple of years ago, or a couple contexts ago? Have you heard anything about that recently? Um, I know who's been doing a little bit of work on that. So work is being done. So there's been some work being done. I don't think he's actually working on it right now. Oh, no. Okay. So to answer your question, there's some work going on. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Hi. Tim just Tim Bell just entered the room as well. We're we're very you know I'm, I'm going off of memory here. I can't believe I'm doing it. Is there a technical systems mission uh, under under AST to some of these new entrants? The question is, is there a technical assistance mission? Is there is there a, uh, uh, is there a technical assistance mission? A part of our a part of our uh, our uh, right, our office, our mission. Yeah. Um, we we have two we have a twofold mission. One is to protect and ensure or ensure public safety, you know, and national interest of the United States, and blah blah blah. The second mission is to encourage, facilitate, and promote. What we, in terms of technical assistance, something we're doing is we just create. Well, number one, we do. What we used to advertise is one hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of R and D annually, you know, to 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 investigate commercial space transportation, you know, kind of technical issues. Well, we start really going and, and peeking under all the stones and putting all the crevices. We were doing three to four million dollars worth of R&D, you know, that to help support our regulatory mission. And that helped generate guides, guideline documents, advisory circles that help, that tell people um, about different ways of doing certain calculations to, you know, to get through the licensing and, um, application process. More recently, we just announced the creation of a center of excellence for commercial space transportation, which will um, pump a million dollars of FAA money a year for 10 years 
to these two selected teams that were just announced last week, which is New Mexico State University and a couple of Florida universities on their team, as well as the Stanford University with Colorado University as well and UTMB on their teams. And we're going to, and then they have to go out and get matching funds, another million dollars per year from industry to do research that you know gets selected and reviewed and presented uh, on an annual basis. So it got announced last week. Um, I'm in charge of the research going on in AST. Um, we had another million dollars of earmark money actually that came out of Florida for Embry Riddle. I just got done processing those proposals and sending it out. Now we're <coughs> got to start focusing on the COE, the Center of Excellence proposals. So we're at our conference in February which will be at the Washington Convention Center on the 9th and 10th of February next year. Um, the first track on the first day will be up totally dedicated to the R&D, so there'll be a full day of presentations by New Mexico, by Stanford, and by Embry-Riddle. will be public domain information. Yeah, everything's public. Uh, and how does that technical assistance mission uh, drill down into the licensing process, or is there a firewall there? there, there there's not necessarily a firewall, and again, um, a lot of people tend to think uh, there's this there's this competing factors of encouraging the industry and trying to regulate the industry as well. And you know, I I try to put a positive spin on it, saying if we wanted to regulate to perfect safety or near perfect safety, you just raise the regulatory bar so high that only few get over. You know, when you're sure that they can fly safely, but nobody else gets to fly with any level of you know perceived risk. Um, whereas because we have the mission to encourage. We're now kind of forced to re-examine what our regs are to make sure that that barrier is as low as, you know, is, Appropriate. is appropriately safe, right? And so, um, so I don't really think they're competing. I think any good governance involves encouraging the industry, uh, and so a lot of that technical um, research will go toward supporting our regulatory mission, so improving. You know, probability of loss calculations. We're doing a lot of fragmentation uh, impact uh, experiments now uh, with redstone arsenal, you know, basically shooting BBs at aluminum plates and stuff. Um, we're getting into a lot of, uh, um, we're going to start doing a lot of induced lightning strike kind of uh, research and whatnot. So we're, we're also working, because we're at the very outset of this, our plans are, we have not implemented yet, flying in parallel with NASA, getting them on the team and on our side. See, the COEs, the COE structure has got a government side and a university side. Universities can have their technical board of advisors and their supporters. The government's going to have their technical folks and supporters. And so we're going to get NASA on the government side with us to fly in parallel so we can take advantage of all the research that NASA's done, both on the space as well as the aeronautics side. And you know, to make sure that you know, we're not reinventing the wheel and we're you know, working to the benefit of all. NASA is the biggest customer. They, they are very interested in this. So I've been talking with Exploration Systems Mission Directorate. I've been talking with Space Operations Mission Directorate. I've got to get into Jay Wan Shin at Aeronautics and we've got, you know, make sure everybody's sitting at the table. Jim Adams is here from NASA headquarters. And I didn't talk to him about this yet, but I don't think, I really don't think science is going to be all that interested in the research we're doing. But they might, you know, so, so who knows? Why not? I don't know. They might, I mean, maybe they care about, you know, dispersal fields on a, on a, on a you know, planetary body of their vehicle. You know, I don't know. We probably can talk some reason they should be there. I, I won't exclude them if they want to come. Tim. Oh, I was just going to um, randomly ask, and I know I haven't been here for everything. Are you working with the DOD about range operations, range rules? Did you guys go over any of that about, you know, what does it really take? What does the Air Force want? Is there any way to get that data a different way or maybe a little bit faster? Your question is, are we working with DOD, working on range safety regs and all that sort of stuff? Um, right now we have, I think, three or four people down at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station co-located with the 30th and the 45th Space Wings down there. Um, always looking at range issues. We've got some memorandums of agreements with them on you know, how to work together. Um, range safety is a major issue and range operations is in you know, delays, cause a lot of cost uh, to you know, the commercial guys down there. I know SpaceX is, you know, constant. There's a lot of you know discussions and you know headbutting that go on because SpaceX wants to do this and the range doesn't want them to do that and everybody and we're in the middle trying to make sure that everything's done you know properly whatever so yes we are talking with DOD we are talking with the range folks there I'm not sure exactly what our involvement right now is out at Van uh, Vandenberg you know the also New Mexico White Sands 
Well, we're flying. Well, right now, I don't. You know, we don't have launch operations out of there. You know. Does not, up, up airspace fly out of uh, New Mexico? Spaceport America. Yeah. Which is not White Sands. Right, it's right not, but yeah. it's right next door. Right, but it's not White Sands. Yeah, but it's not White Sands. Yeah, it's, it's not yeah. <laughs> so even when they overfly they, they, White Sands. So Up Aerospace actually had to work out their stuff with Spaceport America right. and the FAA. Right. And then because they chose to fly their vehicle right. into the White Sands area, they had to work completely separate agreements right. with White Sands. So, so that... That, no, no. that comes back to the question of oh, is there are anything we with white is there any is there any way to make that easier? Um, oh, oh, Spaceport America, the, the New Mexico people have been you know really good about trying to keep the White Sands commanders up to speed and make sure that the White Sands commanders are working with Spaceport America and with Spaceport America customers. Um, unfortunately, just as soon as they get one commander up to speed and <laughs> on board with what all's going on, he's moving here. off to uh, his career track, and another another person is coming in. So, so the New Mexico folks should get pretty good at reorienting. <laughs> there are other options. I mean, there's the Mojave test area. So, but that, uh, that that doesn't that get close to Edwards and that airspace? Yeah, but the Edwards has great. <laughs> you have some friends there? Well, I'm, I'm working with them about airspace issues right now because we launch rockets there. So. And our orbital also is a, it's a viable location. Mojave. Mojave for experimental development. We have a person that's, co that's located at Biden, Michelle Murray. And she works with Dave, and she yep. works with Stu Witt, and she works with the Dryden guys and the Edwards guys. And so everybody's been real cooperative and real, you know, you know trying to make things work, you know, so. I just wasn't sure if there was, you know, anything. Uh, I know Space Florida has been trying to work with the, the Air Force just to make it easier for people, and the Air Force has been working on streamlining their stuff. But I didn't know if you guys were working on collaboratively coming up with regulations so that you know once they met your regulations, it was the same as the Air Force's regulations, or if yours are just on top of that. Or yeah, and I, and I don't really know the answer. Okay. What, to what level? Um, we're, I know we're Al Wassel and Pam Underwood, of course, are down there, um, and they're they've got a real close relationship with them, Al's ex Air Force. But uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, we'd have to ask those guys. Yeah, this is a. Maybe a bit of a twist, uh, so let's, let's switch to the, to the sea launch kind of scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what can you tell us about uh, your knowledge and background with regard to uh, sea launch, especially now that they're, they're I hope that they're going to come out. They're going to come out of bankruptcy. Business. Here's everything I know about sea launch. <laughs> Other than and it has very little to do with the um, regulatory side of the house, but uh, here's what happened. Sea launch in its earlier incarnation, before it went into bankruptcy, Excuse me, was considered by us as a multinational organization. They were regulated by us. We had people on the boats for flights for, to observe the launches. And so they come back with their horror stories about going to the bars at night and or on, the on board and all that sort of stuff. And it's like, you know, but no liquor, you know, days ahead of whatever it is, you know. So we've had people that had that experience and have worked with Sea Launch, you know, to regulate those flights because they were multinational. They went into bank bankruptcy. And they're coming out now, and the way I understand it, when they're come, that they've come out, it's like almost no, it might be zero U.S. you know mm -hmm. participation now. So now it's not a U.S. company at all. We were tracking them in terms of industry analysis and adding them to the number of launches because they were FAA licensed. In terms of our tracking the industry and how many U.S. launches there were, they were part of that number. But um, depending on how they come out of bankruptcy, if there is no U.S. involvement, then they're foreign and it won't be part of our game anymore. So it just depends how they come out of bankruptcy, I guess. And I haven't really. But are, they're not based on the West Coast. No, they. I mean, they're ships. Oh, they're ships. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. They might be. Yeah. Pre bank pre bankruptcy. Yeah, yeah. Their, their launch platform docked at, like in Long Beach. Long Beach. Was that the Boeing part of the? Oh, uh, I don't know. I you know I don't know which part was which. Right. Right. But I, I know the boat actually yeah. docked at, at Long, Long Beach. Beach. I've seen it. Years. 
So, we, so that, like I said, I have this much knowledge. Of so, so let's say, uh, in, in terms of in terms of regulatory, um, they were supposedly one of the easiest licenses for the FAA to grant because they're just out in the middle of the water oh, and yeah. there was. Well, that's kind of what I was driving at. Uh, what if an alternative uh, launching paradigm were to evolve or a sea launch and various unconventional approaches were used to be adopted uh, by a U.S. carrier? What, what's your sense of how that's going to be uh, perceived by you know, from the regulatory? The question is how, how would it be perceived from the regulatory world if a U.S. launch company or an operator chose to have a sea launch kind of I mean, is, is data assessment, you know, accurate roughly that it's a that, yeah, yeah. Process. I would guess that the reg from a regulatory standpoint, it won't be any different than it was to sea launch. If they use the same operation kind of model, it would be the same regulatory process. Certainly, approximated population areas. Come absolutely, up. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I mean, one of the things sea launch, their entire launch, what was considered part of what FAA actually regulates, which is the actual launch to orbit, but not on orbit. Yeah. They were actually on orbit before they got to the west coast of the Americas. Yeah, so, it certainly helps to be out in the ocean. So they, you know, they, they were able to say, here's, here's our ground track, you know, it doesn't matter what our vehicle does, we're not gonna hurt anybody. And as long as that point of instantaneous impact stays off the way, <laughs> not a problem, so get into orbit, you know, quicker than you, you know, there's come no, all that there's time. There's no uh, jurisdictional issues as we go from uh, international waters uh, back into uh, the EEZ, US EEZ, I don't know. I'm guessing not. The uh, the biggest problem that Sea Launch had was actually dealing with ITAR, yeah. the International yeah, Traffic and Arms Regulation, <laughs> um, because they were a multinational corporation. But they were also outside the economic zone, so that pretty much is export, right? Um, like I said, I know their biggest problem is ITAR. Right. Well, that, that, that's a good so. segue to a question. Uh, so, what is your what is your sense of uh, the difficulties that new entrants may face? In during the launching, uh, or excuse me, during the licensing process for launch, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis ITAR. Is there any restrictions there that made that cumbersome in some cases? The ITAR? Yeah. Does ITAR impinge on the licensing process, for example? Because there's lots of technical exchange of data, and as long as the, as the coordination is done directly between the American entity and... and oh, for a multinational? Right, but if there's, if there's multinational participation, I guess the complexities go up. I'm sure they do, and they're even you know even companies like Virgin, you know, and working scale of Virgin has been very difficult. Um, I, I don't know. I'm gonna you know again bleed ignorance <laughs> on that. Uh, ITAR tends to be. I mean, our office was set up originally, like I said, in 1984, part of DOT. It got transferred to um, FAA at some point. I forget what year that was, uh, and that's why it's called AST and not OCST anymore. And under the Department of Transportation, you have the federal. Highway Administration, the Federal Aviation Administration, Federal Railroad, Transit, and I think Maritime is on there. And so each one, like railroads, there are codes. It's a three-letter code for each organization that start with the letter R. For Aviation Administration, it's all three-letter codes that start with the letter A. So now that's why our our organization is called AST. And um, where was I going with that? Oh, we were supposed to be the one-stop shop for all regulatory stuff. And because prior to the creation of the office, you had to coordinate with a gazillion different offices as well. Guess what? You know, ITAR is a totally different animal. We don't even, I don't think we play very much there. You know, so. The EPA is also a separate animal. Well, it's a, well, but we handle <coughs> the environmental, you know, analysis. Yeah, it's, it's, it's it, yeah, because they're licensing, the FAA actually has to do the environmental analysis. So you, you can do the environmental analysis strictly through you. I think your interface is strictly through us. There's five different types of analyses that we do. Policy, payload, I forget them all. Environment, I forget what your procedure up right Yeah, right over. So, we're running, how are we doing on time? You're over. Okay. No. Not by a lot. Is, who's next? I do not know, actually. Well, let's take another question. Okay. Okay. I, have, I have one, one quick question. It's more of a philosophical question. Yeah, assuming a larger, a much larger launch market, people there's a, some people think that we should go with heavy lift, and some people think that it would be cheaper or better to have lots of little launches instead of you know one big launch. Now, from a regulatory point of view, it, you know considering the minimum cost per, to regulate a launch, 
Do you think lots of little launches would be cheaper than a few big launches? From a regulatory st standpoint, it almost doesn't, shouldn't matter. I'm not assuming there's any scale issues here. Mm -hmm. Number of launch issues, it shouldn't matter because we issue what's called a launch mission license. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're sticking with the same mission profile or some, a mission profile which is kind of specified and agreed to up front, and we, we license for that mission profile, you're set. You don't need a license every time you launch. So it could be for a series of launches over a period of time. So whether it's five launches or 50 launches, no big deal as long as you've got the license. So the license is not one vehicle, one launch? No, it's a, a, it's a, mission, a, profile. It's a mission profile, as long as you stay close to that profile. So, so if I have a fleet of five, no God help me one day. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. You had a question. And then we'll make this last one. Yeah. Um, well, the United States, by far, has the most developed legal regime when it comes That's to regulation. Right. And FAA is obviously the biggest contributor to that because you come up with regulation, like the space lot commercial crew regulation, for instance. Right. And I know that most countries of the world that are concerned about regulating efficiently their space se commercial space sector, they look into your guidelines. Right. Um, I know EU like almost wants to copy what you guys have, but uh, well, at least the academics write about that. Right, right. But um, how, how far are you, like what is your involvement internationally? Because the focus was on internal matters like licensing, even if, even if it is outside the U.S. border, it's still U.S. citizens. Right. One of our, one of the, one of the, I don't want to call it a goal of our office, it's not an authorized goal necessarily, but we want to be an international leader in the regulatory regime, creation of the regulatory regimes for other countries. Now look at France, they've gone off and they've created basically a regulatory regime that says the vehicles have to be certified, which is a concept we don't, we're not doing because we think that would crush the industry from the beginning. So we've kind of missed the mark. They didn't you know, basically take what we had and copy it. Other countries like South Korea, um, have been talking to us. The Japanese have been talking to us, um, and as did Kness, you know, and they're looking at creating their regulatory regime. Everybody's got a copy of, you know, our regs, so they can, you know, I guess the, on the civil aviation side, I guess the regulations for the, um, the Joint Aviation Administration or whatever, the CAA, whatever it's called over in Europe, is very similar to, the, the, even the section numbers are pretty much the same. Very, very uniform kind of regulatory regime. That's kind of what we're hoping for for the, the uh, commercial space flight. And it's just too early to tell because you know, other organizations or other nations are looking at what we've got and we're talking to them openly. They come and they talk to us and we answer their questions and uh, then they go away and we don't hear anything. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we're done. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.